And uh, our, our last um, speaker for this session is Jonathan Bunicor. Right. Oh, you've got it. Oh, I'm looking for a right. slide changer. This one? Is this the slide flipper? Yes. Okay. You got it. All right. Yeah, so my, na my name is Jonathan Bunicor. I'm an assistant professor at Boston University School of Public Health. And uh, my, my goal in the next 10 minutes is to not only uh, convince you that a person from public health belongs in a room, but also to uh, convince you that you all are uh, secretly um, going to be public health professionals. Um, so uh, where I wanted to start was to look at this um, process. This is how like uh, EPA, other environmental agencies, um, like health, public health, environmental health professionals look at um, just hazards in the world. Um, we do a lot of very fancy stuff, but very often it breaks down into these four basic steps. It's just to start, start on the left to ask, like, is there some kind of pollutant, a stressor, something like that that people are being exposed to that might cause a problem? Could be, you know, air pollutant, uh, water pollutant, heat, um, a safety issue, um, anything, like, anything that could harm people should go in that box. Um, next up is this dose response assessment. Um, where this is really just a process of asking like, if there's a certain amount of this thing in the environment, what are the health problems at different levels of exposures? So like air, high levels of air pollution are high, worse than uh, lower levels of air pollution. Same goes for water pollution um, and that kind of thing. The uh, third step that goes in parallel with that is this exposure assessment step that asks, um, okay, so we know that there's a thing that is bad. Um, how many people are exposed to it? How long are they exposed to it? Are there certain like um, susceptible windows or susceptible populations, like infants or um, marginalized communities that are um, exposed to this? And then in the end, we have this fourth step called uh, risk characterization, which um, basically just asks like how, how big of a deal is this anyway? Um, so what I've done and do occasionally is I put this. Uh, flip these, these four steps to look like one of these hazmat placards that you'll see on um, like the, the trucks going down the highway or whatever. Um, and then, um, again, here's a simple version. Is there, some, is there something that might be harmful? How harmful is it if you're exposed? Uh, how many people are exposed to it? And how big of a deal is this really? So four basic questions. Um, now, uh, you can overlay this. Look at the full life cycle. This is a supply chain of natural gas starting from your wells and everything on the left over to the right um, all the gas consumers like your commercial buildings your um, residences uh, the use of gas and power plants and all the pipelines storage facilities compressor stations um, processing stations lng terminals whatever else it is that is in between a well and your stove or your furnace and uh, we take our little hazmat placard and say okay how bad is all this anyway um, <clears throat> And I'll argue to you that uh, there are hazards present across the entire supply chain. Um, we know very little about most of these, um, which is, you know, this could potentially be my whole research career as a public health professional. Um, and, but uh, I'm going to talk in detail about a couple of these different endpoints just to explain that um, what you all are doing, like you know all about the climate hazards, um, you're also doing a lot for, uh, for public health. <clears throat> So I'm going to start on the production side of things. Uh, this is a map of every single uh, oil and gas well in the United States. Um, you may have noticed that there's a lot of them. Um, and a natural question that you should be asking yourself is, OK, so how big of a deal is this really? Um, going through a hazard assessment, there's like a lot of things that could be, you could potentially be exposed to. Um, being, I mostly focus on sort of regional air pollution. Um, so I did a study that was focusing on the regional air pollution aspects of this and basically found that there are um, a lot of uh, violations of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards in the US that are due to the air pollution from oil and gas extraction. Um, there's a big kind of plume of ozone in the middle of the country over the oil and gas um, production there. Um, there's NO2, which we're concerned about from a respiratory health standpoint. Um, this tends to be more concentrated in production areas. And then PM2.5, which is our standard um, aerosol, um, somewhere in between. So that's great. Um, and then running it, running it through all the science that we have about who lives where and what the health impacts of these different pollutants are. Um, we have about 7,500 deaths per year in the United States due to air pollution from oil and gas production. 
uh, about 410,000 asthma attacks, and 220, uh, these are children that are newly diagnosed with asthma per year due to oil and gas, just the production side, pollution in the US. Um, so totaling up all the health damages, um, on top of this, there's like uh, emergency department visits, hospitalizations, heart attacks, strokes, um, a whole growing menu of health outcomes that are related to um, air pollution. And uh, we can put a price tag on this of about 77 billion with a B dollars yearly due to production of oil and gas. Um, and as you've heard, um, geothermal will be able to kind of put a dent in that. So that's just the production side. Um, and I'm gonna move over to the other end of this, which is the stove. Um, they do emit air pollution. Um, there's benzene, which is a carcinogen, so it causes cancer. There's a whole lot of volatile organic compounds that come along with that. There's NO2 when you burn it again and methane, which is the greenhouse gas that we're all worried about from a climate standpoint. Um, so Zainab, and myself, and maybe a few other people in the room, Nathan, um, were involved in a study that um, basically sampled gas around Boston. So we put it in a canister, sent it to a lab, and they told us what was in it. Um, and uh, it looks like an organic chemistry textbook. Um, there was uh, a lot of methane as expected, a lot of ethane as expected, but a whole lot of things that were not methane and they were not ethane. Um, we got hexane, benzene, toluene, and heptane, carcinogenic, uh, MP xylene, carcinogenic, carcinogenic xylene, and then all these other things that are also uh, carcinogenic. Um, so they went on to keep doing this kind of research. Uh, turns out that Boston's not the only place that has a problem. Um, it's, uh, there's also issues related to these odorants, um, which is the chemical that is uh, intentionally added to the gas stream so we can smell it when it leaks. Um, turns out that humans don't like how it smells because it is a respiratory irritant. It's harmful. Um, and potentially there's other health issues related to it. Um, but it is uh, present in all the gas everywhere. Um, and again, looking at just benzene, again, um, basically every single canister they sent to a lab had some amount of benzene in it. Um, Boston is actually on the lowest end of the spectrum as far as um, benzene concentrations. The highest in the US is Los Angeles, and the highest of places in, the, uh, in North America that they sampled was uh, Vancouver and Los Angeles. So um, you know, I could go on for hours about every single one of these spots, but um, I, I just wanted to give folks kind of a small snapshot of the types of health hazards that you all are helping to prevent by switching over to geothermal. Um, because if you uh, change what's going on on the right side of the supply chain, you're having ripple effects all the way across the supply chain and reducing air pollution, reducing safety hazards due to gas storage, which I could talk for hours about, um, reducing use of pipelines, reducing compressor station pollution, um, and you know, really being a public health resource. So that's it. Thank you so much. I am feeling really grateful for those three amazing talks to start our day.